Okay. So next one. Earlier, water in the pool had a POS of 10. After adding a buffer, the POS is now uh, the PS is now eight. Which of the following is true? So we, they gave us POH and PH at the same time. So somehow we have to convert. You, it's it's up to you. You know, whichever you're comfortable, you can convert POH into PH and compare, or you can convert PH into uh, you know POH or POH into PH. You know, it's up to you. But from, I think it's easier just to do it as pH because that's what we're familiar with, right? So if they're starting with pOH of 10, so at the starting point, what is the pH that we have? Four, right? pH is equal to four at the starting point. But now it's eight. So if we look at the choice, what is the first one said? Initially, the water was basic. Is POS for basic? No, right? So it's acid, so this one cannot be right. right? The water become more acidic, so from four to eight, is it becoming more acidic or more basic? Basic, right? So this one is also not correct, okay? The pH of water decrease. Is it decreasing? No, it's increasing, right? So that can't be right. So now the question, the concentration of hydrogen ion, is it increasing or decreasing? So pH, pH 4, what is the concentration of hydrogen ion? 10 to the, so the concentration is equal to 10 to the negative 4, right? But for, the ne for, the, for, for pH 8, concentration ion is equal to 10 negative 8. Which one is bigger, negative 4 or negative 8? Negative 4 is bigger, right, because it only has 4, 0, or, you know, 4 decimal points. So like eight, negative eight, that means that's two, like four more zero in front of it. So that means from big to small, is it increasing or decreasing? Decreasing, right? So the answer to this one is E, which is hydrogen uh, ion concentration is decreases. Question. can't really see what actually is on the screen, so if you have trouble seeing it, let me know. So um, this question will be, uh, this, uh, the information will be used for question six and seven. So John is a laboratory technician and is assigned to run a test on a patient blood sample. He's supposed to drop red blood cells with a 80% solvent into a beaker with a solution of 20% solute. However, he did not have enough sleep and he accidentally dropped the sample in a beaker with a solution of 20% solvent instead. So the first question asks, after the accident, the cell would be blank compared to the solution in the beaker and look blank under the microscope, okay. So for, for this kind of problem, we know that for the tonicity, this is a tonicity problem. So make sure you draw the diagram to make your life a little easier when you try to address the problem. So we talk about this beaker, right? We have solution and we have the red blood cell, okay. So the red blood cell, they're given the information is 80%. Solvent is H2O, right? So we have 80% H2O in the cell. So now we have to pick and choose. What did they say? They said after the accident, 
which, which pieces of information that we use. Do we use 20% solute or we use 20% solvent? Right, so after the accident, the accident is right there, right? He's supposed to drop, but he did not. Okay, so he put this. So they have to be 20% solvent. Right, so. So with this 20% solvent, so solvent again is water, right? So the next step is we draw the arrow, right? Water from high to low, this diffusion, if you recall, right? Concent high concentration to low concentration. So the water would flow outside the cell, right? So looking at the choices, what do we have here? So it flow outside. So the the second uh, the s that means if it you have more H two O is it hypotonic or hypertonic? Okay. She said in class, right? Um, more H T O hypo, right? H two O hypo, right? So that means the first uh, one would not be one, right? So. And the water is going out of the cell, so the cell would be shrivel or shrink, you know, whatever term pertaining to that. So the answer has to be, right? Question so far? Okay. So the next one is, uh, number seven is similar. They just ask, if John did what he's supposed to do, what's gonna happen, basically. So we can draw the same thing. So now we have 80% H2O, but now instead of 20%, you know, H2 uh, solvent, so he has 20% solute, right? But again, when we compare, we have to compare water and water, right? So 20% solute give us 80% H2O or water, right? So if they are equal, what kind of tonicity we have? Isotonic, right? So isotonic here, so the, the answer would be E here. So the flow going back uh, inside and outside is the same, right? Am I going too fast? Too slow? No? Okay. So, uh, what is organic chemistry? Okay. So, the first one, org the study of organic produce. Obviously, no, right? I'm just putting it to have some fun. So, uh, the study of carbon compound, is it correct? Right? If you're not sure, maybe you can just put the question mark. The study of hydrocarbon, no, right? So the answer here is the uh, study of carbon compound. The study of uh, hydrocarbon is incorrect because it only include hydrogen and carbon, right? So uh, organic chemistry, uh, organic uh, chemistry has more than that. You know, we talk about protein, protein has nitrogen. Nitrogen, you know, it's not, it's, you know, it's addition to the hydrogen and carbon. So we study more than just uh, carbon and hydrogen. Okay. So number nine, what is this molecule here? So this molecule, when we look at this, we can look at the functional group, right? So if we look at this, a functional group that we have, we can see this one. We can see this. There. Okay. So the first one here, what do we see in here? The one that's marked one is carboxyl, right? Carboxyl. So this one, this one is carboxyl. What about number two? 
Number two is methyl, right? Number three is what? Amino, very good. So the last one we just have is, if you look what kind of molecule that fall into this category that we have one carbon, we have one hydrogen, we have amino group, we have carboxyl, this would be amino acid, right? So, if you look, monosaccharide, generally, it doesn't have nitrogen, so you can just cross that out to begin with. Fatty acid, you know, it doesn't have uh, the nitrogen uh, either normally. And nucleotide, what's the difference between nucleotide and this, nucle uh, and the amino acid? Nucleotide has pentose, right? Okay, so let me put this maybe just to help remind you a little bit about nucleotide. It's so nucleotide would have nitrogenous base, right? We have the pentose, and we have the, uh, the phosphate group. Okay, so that's just uh, different. Okay, for number 10, which of the following is true about the uh, protein structure? Okay, so let's talk about, let's say talk about protein structure. So if we have, we have the primary, right? We have primary structure. What's the key word about primary structure? Peptide, right? So we have peptide that connected to the amino acid. Uh, that connect con amino acid together. So let's say if I put here, I don't know if I, well, let me see. Primary, can you see that? Primary, we, the keyword we talk about is a peptide bond, right? So, so peptide bond connect the uh, amino acid together. So like when we have many, many amino acid, eventually we will have a strand of polypeptide, right? Right, so once we have polypeptide, then it will, the, sec the next one would be secondary So the secondary, the key term that we need to know is what? What do we have here? Folding or coiling, right? So we have folding or coiling. Then with that, we're gonna have hydrogen bond, right? So we have hydrogen bond as well in here very important for secondary. And what do we get in the secondary? We get alpha helix and beta sheet, right? Okay, that's a second, uh, secondary, okay. So the third, uh, tertiary, I'm just gonna put this one instead to save some, uh, tertiary. So the tertiary, what is the important term? Interaction of what? Interaction of the, the, the R group, right? So the 3D. The 3D interaction of R groups. Okay. And the fourth one, which is the quaternary Quaternary includes what? 
the keyword is here, multiple polypeptides, right? So if so far from one, two, three, it's only one single polypeptide. So if you have more than one, then you have quaternary, okay? So I'm just going to put more than one polypeptide. Okay, so I guess th this uh, should help us answer, you know, all, uh, most of the question in uh, protein uh, structure. So which the following is true about protein structure. When denature, protein lost all of its structure. Is it true? We lost the quaternary, tertiary, and secondary, but we still have primary, right? So that one is not true, right? Because the, the problem is the, the word all. So hydrogen bonding is involved in a level two or secondary. Correct, right? It's just up here that we have. So this one is true. The interaction between R group occur in the tertiary lo level. So that's true. So the answer is B and C. Okay. So which of the following protein structure level would be most affected by chaperone? What does cha what is chaperone? What does it what what does it do or help? Folding or coiling, right? So where is the folding or coiling that we did earlier? Right here, right? Right there. So we have, that means this will definitely affect the secondary level. So the answer is this. Next, what type of cell junction would likely be found in the stomach? So the hydrochloric uh, chloric acid does not lead uh, to damage other organ in the human abdomen. So just look through this. Desmosome, what does desmosome do? Holding things down, right? So desmosome, Tight junction, what does it do? Tight junction is to prevent leakage, right? So this one is prevent leakage. Gap junction, communication channel between cell, right? So if you look at this, what are the other two? Anchor, uh, anchoring junction is the same as desmosome, right? So this one. And the gap junction is the same as communication. So, and the one that talk, they talk about this one, the, the, you don't want it to leak. So prevent leakage, the answer, this one would be tight junction. Okay, so question so far? So next one, which of the following is most, li most likely affect uh, on the cell mem membrane fluidity? Okay, so this one, um, so I'm just going to do it real quick here. So if we have this, this is a bi, a bi uh, membrane. Okay, so so the membrane could be very very rigid and tight when the temperature is low, and it could be very fluid when it the temperature is high. So in this case, the answer to this is the actually is the cholesterol. The cholesterol, let me put this, if the cholesterol is greater. So the cholesterol is the big, mo uh, it's somewhat bigger molecule that can, you know, go in between the 
you know, the, mo the, the uh, phospholipid molecule here. So that means if it's too tight, this uh, cholesterol can go in between and make it a little less rigid. At the same time, if its uh, temperature is too high, the molecule can move very fast and, you know, the gap between the, mo uh, the, the molecule is high, uh, it's, it's large. So then it can fill the gap, it make it less fluid. fluid. So the, in this case, the cholesterol can act as the buffer, you know, in, uh, for the bilayer the membrane, okay? So next, uh, integral protein or transmembrane, which one best describe the integ uh, integral protein? Okay, so here, integral protein is transmembrane. So if it's transme transmembrane, it has to have the same characteristics as the membrane, right? Because it's going through both sides. So that means it has what's it called? Amphipathic. Character, characteristic. So the amphipathic means both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So if we look at this, if we know that the integral protein has both uh, uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic, so we look at the choices. You know, um, if it go through the membrane, it's, it shouldn't be small, right? Because it's, you know, it go through the, uh, the whole thing. It's much larger than the uh, phospholipid itself. So the answer would be B and C, so your choice would be there. Okay. So for 15, the first law of uh, thermodynamic is the is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Is that correct? Yes, right. So the first is uh, the first law is energy cannot be created or destroyed. The second law is the disorder or chaos tend to increase. Okay. So just in case if um, there's some question like that. Okay, which of the following is true about exergonic reactions? So exergonic would be, what do we know? If we have exergonic, so we know that we'll have negative delta G, right? We know it is spontaneous. We know, what else? Is it? Breaking bond or forming bond? So we know it's going to be a breaking bond or catabolic. And also, if it's breaking bond, what do you use to break bond? What kind of reaction? Hydrolysis, right? So if you know one, if this one is ash or exergonic, so the endergonic is totally the opposite. So if you know one, you should know the other, right? So in this case, we have all of this. You can you can choose. So so this one, A negative and C. So the answer would be A and C here, right? So for positive, it's going to be endergonic. Uh, endergonic. We're going to have posit, uh, positive delta uh, G. We're going to have non-spontaneous, right? We're going to have uh, anabolic, right? And the reaction used is condensation. Okay. So 17, a reaction has a delta G of 100 kilojoule per mole. Uh, after adding an enzyme activation, energy of reaction changed dramatically. With the enzyme, the time span was cut by 50%. What did the enzyme affect the delta G? 
what is the rule that uh, the professor said in class? Delta G never change, right? So these, these two enzyme reduce delta G, delta G change. So that's one is not correct. Uh, it's, it's not correct. So increase, no. Delta G doesn't change. That's the answer. Okay. So don't get trapped by the word, oh, it's reduced dramatically by 50%. So don't be. Okay, next one. Which of the following is not true about glycolysis? Okay, glycolysis, where does it happen? Cytoplasm, right? So just look into the first one. Um, Glycolysis, it is a substrate level phosphorylation, is it correct? Yes, right? So, enzyme are required? Yes, if you use it, uh, if it's a substrate, you require enzyme. It's occur in metrics? No, so that one. So the uh, product includes two pyruvate? Yes, so the answer is this one. So next, uh, 19, blank catalyzes a transfer of phosphate group from ATP to another molecule. Okay, so whenever you see the term catalyze, you should think of enzyme, right? So when you see the word here, which, uh, uh, which one that you, see, you know right away is a part of enzyme or is enzyme? Because the enzyme, like, all of them like virtually end with ASE, right? ASE. So in here, this one, either this one, this one, or this one, right? So you know the enzyme has the ASE uh, at the end, but you know the RNA polymerase has nothing to do with that, right? And the ligase is in the uh, DNA synthesis. So these two definitely not. So the answer is kinase. Right? So if you don't remember what kinase is, at least you know some, there's some way you can look into uh, making choices. Just you know, for uh, the information, what is kinetic core? Kinetic core is a protein that attached to the centromere. You know, the, uh, the function of the kinetic core is, uh, is where the microtubule or your spindle fiber will attach, okay? So that is uh, the kinetic core. And MAD is the gene that expresses the protein on the kinetic core that prevent uh, from, uh, from entering the anaphase. So basically, if the kinetic core does not attach to the spindle fiber, it will not go into uh, anaphase, okay? So 20, okay. John Breda P uh, that has heterozygous uh, gene for the large size green color and uh, smooth skin with another P of the same genes of uh, size and color, but not skin. Due to his clumsiness, he dropped the laptop in the pool, but he need to turn in the report. Uh, but now he has to determine the um, result manually. How many Punnett square boxes does John need for this experiment? Okay, so we look at this Punnett square, we need to know the genotype of the parents, right? So the genotype of the parent, then we determine the Punnett square. So we have, let's say if we have, we think about largest, the size is A, color is B, and smooth skin is C, let's say. And they said it's heterozygous gene, the first one, so it's going to have to be AA, big A, and CC, right? Because they are heterozygous, the first one. So the second said that another P of this same gene, only for size and color, so this cross with the size and color like this, they said, but not the skin. So that means the skin, does it matter? It has to be smooth or 
rough, it doesn't matter. What matter is it, it has to be homozygous. That's all. Uh, I'm just going to put it here as the homozygous, the recessive. Okay. So with this, we use what rule? 2n rule, right? 2n for each of these provide us the gamete. What is the n? n is the heterozygous pair, right? So how many heterozygous pair? One, two, three. For here, for this one is one, two. So we only have two. So two, 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 two cube is eight times four, which is 32. Make sense? Right? So, next one. This one, I just have want to make sure that, that, be careful, this one, you have to look, who is your professor? You know, I don't know if they talk about the same thing for, you know, each section. So this one is the, the kind of iffy one, but, you know, that's why I kind of put here how I come up with this for you guys to begin with. So if 2n is equal to 20, what is the ratio of the number of chromosomes in anaphase to the number of chromatids after cytokinesis uh, 1? So we know that for sure the first one when we talk about anaphase, there's no Roman numeral or letter uh, number after that. So this is mitosis, right? So when you have the number after the name of the phase like that, so this one is meiosis. So mitosis 2n, what do we, what's the purpose of mitosis? Mitosis is to make unreplicated diploid, right? So for meiosis, we have we can do meiosis one, and meiosis two. What's the purpose of meiosis one? To make replicated haploid, right? So meiosis two would be to make unreplicated haploid. So if you look at this, just from the question, they said, uh, what's the number of chromatid after cytokinesis 1? Cytokinesis 1 is at the end of meiosis 1, right? So that means at that point, we're going to have replicated haploid, right? So 2n diploid, 2n is 20, so 1n is 10, right? But it is replicated. So the total number of chromatids is 20, right? So the anaphase, that's the, so this one would be 20 as I put it there. So for the mitosis, this is iffy that, you know, your professor might, you know, one professor might, uh, might tell you that all of the chrom number of chromosomes stay the same, doesn't change, right? So I'm just putting it here as 40, just because when, I, when we, in anaphase, the chromosome separated, you know, once it's separated, it becomes its own chromosome. So that's why I put 40. You know, if, you, if your professor said, don't count it as 40, count it as 20, then, you know, go with your professor, okay? I just wanna make sure that. But uh, from my approach, that would be 40 because the chromosome split, okay? So in here, the answer, uh, based on my, ans uh, my approach, here, the answer would be two to one, right? Uh, 40 to 40, uh, 220. Okay, so number 22, which of the following is true about meiosis? So synapses occur in prophase one, is it correct? It's true, right? So uh, what also occur in the uh, prophase one? We have crossing over, we have tetrad, right? The, uh, when it synapses and 
you know, they can cause uh, crossing overs. So what else do we have? That the for choice B, each chromosome line up at the metaphase plate in metaphase one. Is that correct? Is the chromosome line up at the metaphase plate or the pair line up? So since it is meiosis, the metaphase one is not a chromosome, it's the pair that is actually line up, right? So the B was not correct. So after meiosis one daughter cell go through G1 only before entering into prophase two. That's correct, right? Chromosomes are replicated in all anaphase. Is that true, all anaphase? So unreplicated all anaphase of the meiosis. So we just know from up here that it's replicated in meiosis one. So that one is also incorrect. So the Right, so the answer would be more than one answer for this one, okay? So 23, which of the following does not occur in mitosis? Uh, each centromere is separated, mitosis, right? So cleavage furrow can be found in telophase, yes, right? So spindle fibers start from uh, start forming in prophase. That's also correct. The nuclear envelope disintegrate in telophase. Is it is it disappearing or is coming back? Telophase is the opposite of prophase, right? So the pro the pro uh, the prophase is dis disintegrate. So this one is not correct. So the answer has to be that one. Each chromosome is unreplicated in anaphase. So that's correct for mitosis. Okay, am I going too fast? Okay, so um, next, so if 2n equal to h, again, there are, you know, blank chromosome and uh, chromatid in anaphase. So that's a typo. Again, when we talk about uh, uh, anaphase, if 2n, okay, if 2n equal to 8, so anaphase, the chromosome separate, right? So you have this 8 will be 16 and 16. So the answer for me here will be 16 and 16. The thing is, again, if your professor, uh, you know, like don't count that separate chromosome as its own, then your answer for this question has to be eight and 16, okay? Okay, so now the karyotype can tell if a person has which of the following. What is karyotype? is the uh, figure that include all of the chromosome for that person, right? So what can we tell about this if we look at the first one, Klinefelter. What is Klinefelter syndrome? Multiple X's. Can you have two X's, three X's, four X's, and so on? Yes, right? Can it be male or female? It's only for male, right? You have, basically the definition is the multiple X is male, right? So you can have this one. So with, because of that, so you can see that the, all of the different chromosome would show in there. So you would be able to tell, you know, if the person has Klinefelter, okay? What about Turner syndrome? Just one X, right? So that's, so if you can, if the person has only one X, can it be male? No, right? You can have to be female. So then if you only have one X chromosome, then it will show on your karyotype. 
What about Down syndrome? What's, in, what's the, the nickname for Down syndrome? Trisomy, right? What chromosome number? 21. So, so if, you, if chromosome number 21 show up three of them, then you have um, Down syndrome. So all of them. So the answer would be all of this. You guys want to take a break or just keep going? Okay, so just in case. Okay. So the next one, small and green are homozygous recessive, and heterozygous big and red is crossed with another heterozygous big and red bean. What phenotype will you most likely found in the offspring? So. We have two traits here, two genes, crossing with two genes. So this is a problem of dihybrid, right? So let's say they said small, small and green are homozygous recessive. Okay, so if I just put little a, little a here, as small and bb as green, so they as, um, the heterozygous big and red, so what is, if you have the little a, little a as small, so your big, heterozygous big would be big a, little a, right? And red would be big b, little b, right? So, and they said these cross with another one, the same thing. So if we have this cross with this, do we know right away what's the ratio that we get? Right? So the ratio would be 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, right? So with this, which one, What the question is what phenotype would you most likely found in the offspring. So the offspring, which one would be the nine? So the one that contained the, the nomin dominant, right? So the, the answer to this would be big and red. So if we know this one is big and red, do we know the, I guess the, la the next one, what is the probability? that the offspring will be small and green. So small and green would be this one, the last one, just that one, right? So one, so we have nine plus three plus three plus one, the total of 16, and it can only be one out of 16. So the answer would be D. So next one, the probability that the offspring will be blank is 316. So basically those are these two, right? So those are these two. These two would be one would have the uh, dominant gene for the color. Another one would be for the size. So in this case, we're going to have, so if it's, if both of them are recessive, that is not correct, right? Because we just did that only one sixteen, right? Small and red, is that right? So this one, it can be small and can be red, so that one is true. Big and green, so, but we can't be big and red because that shows the both the um, dominant. So that one's just wrong. So whatever has A is wrong, whatever has D is wrong. So this two, B and C. Right?
so 29, you know you need to know this question problem, right? So she, uh, your professor loves munchkin cats, so you need to know this. Uh, munchkin cats, uh, munchkin is an autosomal dominant trait in, the cat, in cats. It is lethal in homozygous dominant condition in embryos. So if two munchkin cats may, what is the probability of genotypically normal hitching? Okay, so let's say autosomal trait and the homozygous dominant is lethal. So if that's the case, will you ever have the born homozygous? No, right? So the that means it tells us that this munchkin cat, the these two, the genotype has to be like this, right? So they cross. Again, if you use the, the two n rule, so two to the one because one heterozyg uh, heterozygous pair, right? So two to one. So the, your Punnett square will be two by two. So in this case, we're going to have this two by two. So we have big M, little M, big M, little M, and we cross. Right? So since the homozygous dominant is lethal, lethal so it's never been born, right? It's never going to be born. Um, the question is asking, what is the probability of genotypically normal? What does it mean by genotypically normal? Normal means it's not affected and it cannot be a carrier, right? So in this case, not affected, not a carrier. So this sin big M is a dominant gene, so it cannot have that, okay? So we have this, let's see, I'm going to use it. So that one is what we're looking for, geotypically normal. So the answer is 1 over 3, right? Because we don't count the one that is lethal. Question? Okay. So next one, two poor cats are in mating season. Again, a male calico cat with two X, uh, two X, X, uh, Klein Felter syndrome, but with a Turner syndrome orange female cat. Assuming that the sperm can only carry one sex chromosome, what is the chance of having a black male offspring? That is very sad, right? So these two severe, you know, diseases, cat, you know, mating, but we'll make it work. So for this one, s that means the male cat would have two X's, and they say calico, so we're going to have X, right? So that would be the uh, genotype of the Klein-Felter, and the Turner syndrome, we're going to have just an orange, right? So this cross and the, the, que uh, the problem said you can only have one gamete for one sex chromosome. So in this case, we're going to have for each. So you're going to have this three boxes, right? So the fir this one will be XO. This one will be XO from the male. XB from the male and Y, right? So we cross this, we have XO, 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 XB, XO, and Y. So the question asks, what is the chance of having a black male offspring? Zero, right? For the male one is the XY and we, can we only have XO for the on X, chromo on X chromosome, so that means we don't have any black. 
fe uh, black male offspring? So the answer is A. Question? Anyone? Okay. 31, color blindness is uh, uh, homozygous recessive and expressed on X chromosome in humans. What does this tell us? It's expressed on X chromosome, so it's X link, uh, it's X link, right? So uh, if a colorblind marry a woman who is a carrier for color blindness, so what is the probability that the newborn will be a carrier? So a guy is colorblind, right? So that means if we have this, that will be the guy genotype, right? Because the guy cannot have, um, cannot be a carrier, right? So, and the woman who has, is a carrier of color blindness. So the woman would be crossed with just one C. The other one doesn't have, right? It's a carrier. So with this again, this is heterozygous, heterozygous, so two to the one, two to the one, so we have two by two. So we can write this. So the first one would be X and Y and XC and X. So we have this and XCY, XCX, XY. So the question asks, what is the probability that the newborn will be a carrier? So is this, this one a carrier, right? This one is not a carrier, right? So this one is. What about this one? No, right? It's not affected. About this one. So the answer to this is only 25%. Because male, yes. Male cannot be a carrier because what do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah, I only use the the bottom left. So the question is, what is the probability that the newborn will be a carrier? They didn't say it's either male or female, right? So you cannot assume that it's male, too, right? Do you, like they said, the newborn, do you know it's male or female? You don't know, right? And also, when you look at, look at it overall, they just ask, which basically they just ask, what's the percentage of the uh, carrier from all the probability? So there's only one out of four. Then which of the following play an important role in male sex? determination in human. So the first one, for your information, not relevant. So AGG is just the, the code on, right, that you can find on your um, mRNA. MAD, we talk about it. ATP, you already know what it is, the energy, right, the adenosine triphosphate. So SRY is the gene that determining um, the maleness in the Y chromosome. So 33, which of the following is true about a cat with Turner syndrome? So it can only be female, is that correct? 
So it can be male. No, right? So that one, no. So it can be a calico cat. No, right? You have to have two X's, right, to, to be a calico cat. So it can be a carrier of, uh, it cannot be a carrier of homozygous recessive disease, right? So this one is correct. It cannot be carrier just like the sex link, right? If you only have one X and you have that one, then you're going to express that, right? Yes. Uh, well, Turner syndrome, you only have one X, right? So that means if you have one X and you have that on there, you definitely going to be, so either you have it or you don't, right? Just one X. So that one, for this one, the answer would be A and B, right? So that's why uh, just one X, because just like the first choice, it can only be female, right, if you only have one X. You no know Y, no other Xs, you know, so it's, you can only be female for uh, Turner syndrome. Well, just maybe, maybe I should just put it here real quick so you can see that. Typically, if you have a recessive, you will express that, right? So for, this is for normal person, right? So if you have Turner syndrome, you only have one X, and you have that little C on it, then you're going to have it. You know, there's no other choices, right? So for 34, you know, if guanine is 50%, what percent is thymine in this? So how do we calculate this? We know the, the total has to be 100%, right? So if we have guanine, guanine complement with cytosine, right? So that means if 50% is already guanine, 50% must be cytosine. So the answer is 0% in that particular part. So you, we can do the same thing, you know, with other, let's say if, for example, if we have guanine of, let's say, 30%, right? So the same question, what is the pers uh, percent, uh, what percent is thymine? So that you can go with the 3, 30% for cytosine. So what you have left, this is already 60%, so what you have left is 40%, right? So this 40% has to split between A and T. As simple as that, okay? So which of the following may not be an RNA? So the key, this one is just like simple identification you know, identification on the strand. RNA, what's the difference between RNA and, T and uh, DNA? T and U, right? So if you have T, you may, if you have U, then it's an RNA. Which one may not be an RNA? So if you have U, that means you can have RNA, right? All of them have U except D. D doesn't have U. But can you tell whether it's DNA or RNA? You can't. But they say which one may not. Because this one could be a DNA, right? Because it doesn't contain U. So the answer is D. So next one, I'm just throwing this one. It's should be very simple. Uh, which complementary is associated with three hydrogen bond? So the rest, besides the A, T, and C, G, right? You don't have to worry about anything else, but we know A, T is two hydrogen bonds, C, G is three. 
So the answer to this one is C and G. Am I going too fast? Everybody? Okay. okay. So the building block of DNA consists of which of the following? So building block of DNA, yes. Uh, when, I'm sorry? 36. Oh, right there, okay. So the co which complementary is associated with three hydrogen bond? So between these two nitrogenous base, they're gonna make hydrogen bond, right? In that what happened in the second, uh, secondary, uh, uh, no, it's, uh, between, it's between the DNA strand, like anti parallel right? So between A and T, they will make two hydrogen bond, and between C and G, they will make three hydrogen bond. So uh, usually, I, I'm not sure if she, if you are in which section. If you're in Miss Thomas section, she always say that the book has it, you know, the figure incorrectly. So there should be two hydrogen bond between A T and three hydrogen bond between C and G. You know, the the figure was just not really representing of what it's supposed to be. Okay. So 37, the building block of DNA consists of the following, except the building block of um, DNA is what? The nucleotide, right? So with the nucleotide, we need nitrogenous base. We need phosphate. Do we need five carbon sugar? Okay. Carboxyl, do we need it? No, right? So that one is a no, except, because they ask except. So every time they have the word accept or not or something like that, be careful. Thirty-eight cell in a nerve uh, cell in nerve tissue stay at G zero. Is that correct? Right. So it stay at G zero. So what does it mean by staying at G0? It stops dividing, right? So it just stay right there. So more cell, you know, would go through uh, the state, other, sta uh, other phase. But uh, for a nerve cell, you just go through G1 and then and stay at the G0. Next one, the information talk about John, a biomedical science student going to school full time and work part time, stay up late and did not have enough sleep, trying to finish his assignments. During genetic lab, he needs to replicate the DNA from the sample. There are several enzymes involved uh, due to sleep deprivation. So um, the first two attempts were not successful. So then, they will have the question as, I guess it's okay. So what did he forget to put? What did he forget to put in his first attempt if the DNA was frag fragmented? Okay, so if that's the case, uh, now we know this is a DNA synthesis problem, right? So. If you, I have, if you've been to uh, my session, I have a little thing that make it easier to remember. But if you don't, I'll just put it up here. So you know we have what? He sang to him. Right, that's what I, have in here. So this is the, you know, uh, what we have, he sings to print, three, one, lick two. So what did he forget to put? If you look, all of this, the first one, he is a helicase, right? What does helicase do? Split the DNA, right? Um, sing is single-stranded 
binding protein. So it pinned down the single stranded, right? Next one is to, uh, two is a topoisomerase, right? Topoisomerase is what prevent winding at the replication fork. So that's a key term, replication fork. Okay. So then after that, the RNA primase will put down the primer, right, as a starting point. Then after that, the DNA polymerase three would start synthesizing, you know, the DNA from which direction? Five to three, right, always. Okay. So then after finish that, the DNA polymerase one will come and remove the primer and then add more nucleotides, right? And the last one here, um, the ligase. Ligase will seal the Okazaki fragment gap, right? And then the last one, two, which is the DNA polymerase two, will repair or fix whatever uh, uh, mistake that might have occurred, okay? So the, all of this, the only one that deal with fragment that we know here is ligase. So the answer is ligase. So one thing we, I, I, I might have talked a little bit about this, but just to make sure, is primase DNA or RNA? RNA. Okay, to make sure you need to know that it's RNA. So they might ask about this. It's, it, it's different from the rest of the polymerase. So next one, John also forgot to put one enzyme again in his second attempt, but the level was not legible. Before adding the, la the enzyme that he forgot, he found that DNA was uh, single-stranded with no complementary at all. After adding the enzyme, the DNA was successfully replicated. What enzyme did John forget to add? So if nothing on the single-strand at all, that means do we even have primer? No, right? So the, because the primer is complement uh, is complementary to the strand as the initial thing. So this one is actually the answer is primase. Okay. So next, which of the following is true about DNA synthesis? So we have first, synthesis is continuous on leading strand. Is that correct? Yes, right? So it, it doesn't stop on the leading strand. Synthesis is continuous on lacking strand. Definitely wrong. Right. Leading strand contain Okazaki? No, right? It doesn't. So lacking strand contain Okazaki fragment on a template strand. Is it, where is the Okazaki fragment? It's on the, the Okazaki is not on the strand, right? It's, uh, it's, on, it's not on the template strand. It's on the syn uh, synthesis. So, uh, so this one is wrong because, just because of this. So the answer is, is A. So 42, what enzyme prevent spinning or, you know, winding at the replication fork? So again, we talk about that. Replication fork has to be topoisomerase, right? So next one, DNA synthesis occur in direction of three to five? No, right? So that one has to be from five to three. So this one is 
fault. So, uh, number 44, which of the following has the right sequence of enzymes for, uh, that use for DNA synthesis? So, if you just, if you just, if you, know, uh, if you just go along with what I have, if you sing to print, you know, three, one, leg two, you can just go with it. You know, use, you know, helicase, single, uh, stranded binding protein, to polysomerate, polymerase, and is it polymerase one? No, right? So we have polymerase three first. So this one, polymerase two, also must be wrong. So single stranded, topoisomerase, primase, polymerase three is, is like it right after polymerase three? No, right? So that one is also wrong. But this one, why do we have polymerase one before? So that is also wrong. So now we come down to last two, topoisomerase, primase, polymerase three, polymerase two. Is that right? That is wrong, right? Polymerase two is the last one, if you call, recall. Or, you know, actually polymerase two is, you know, it's not in this sequence, it's go on and on concurrently because Whenever you have the problem or needs repair, polymerase two will just uh, do the job. So the answer to this one is the last one in that. Okay, so next, which of the following is true regarding transcription? Okay, now this we start talking about transcription uh, and trans translation, I guess. So transcription and translation are the two steps that we need for gene expression or protein synthesis, right? So when we talk about this, the question is maybe which uh, the, at what level would normally be related to uh, regulation here? So because it's starting from DNA, most of this will be regulated in the transcription. Okay, so the first one, which which of the following is true? I guess I, we can just go through this a little bit. So how do we start? If we have the DNA, right? We have DNA from, let's see, from five to three. Three to five. So for here, which for DNA uh, for um, transcription, which direction, uh, which one is the template strand? The template strand for uh, pro for protein synthesis is from three to five, right? So this one is a template strand, right? So then the RNA polymerase which is the only thing that help us in making this uh, mRNA, right? So we have this RNA polymerase bind to the, uh, the template strand. So where does it bind? It binds in this, let's say, this called promoter region, right? And to be more specific, which area in promoter region, which is the Tata box. Okay, so it's Tata box because it has thymine and adenine on it. So it wh that's where it binds and stored. So the RNA polymerase, I guess I'll just put something. If the green thing is RNA polymerase, it's going to bind to that promoter region to be more specific in the Tata box area. And then it start, you know, moving along this strand. And you're going to get what's it called? M or uh, pre-mRNA, right? 
So the pre-mRNA has both introns and exon, right? So, but that's not the ultimate goal of transcription. The purpose of transcription is to make mRNA, right? This one is pre-mRNA, okay? So to make mRNA, we have to get rid of this intron, right? And add the cap and the tail. So we have, let's say we're gonna have this, we have five prime cap and and poly A tail, right? So this one will be our M RNA, right? So, and the process of getting the intron, what do we call it? Splicing, very good. So, to get rid of this, it's called splicing. Okay. Um, what else should I talk about? Okay. All right. So, with this, at least we have some, you know, um, thing to follow now. So which of the following is true about, uh, is true regarding transcription? RNA polymerase produce mRNA? We'll just talk about it. It's, it produce, actually produce pre-mRNA. So if you mean, if it's not really the best answer right now, maybe you put question mark. Carter box is located in the promoter region. That's correct. RNA polymerase can bind anywhere in the promoter region. Is that correct? No. Right? It has to be at the Tata box, right? So that one is wrong. Transcription occur in the cytoplasm. Where is DNA? Nucleus, right? So this one is not in cytoplasm. The goal of transcri transcription is to make pre-mRNA. Pre no, it's to make mRNA. So the answer to this is the Tata box one. So next, which of the following is true about transcription? Pre-mRNA include intron and exon, right? That's correct, right? We just have that. So what's the difference between intron and exon? In Exon include the coding, right? But intron doesn't. Intron does, uh, it's a regulatory, you know, section. So that's important. So make sure you know that. So splicing intron is required to make mRNA. We just talked about that. Five cap, five prime cap is needed to make a complete mRNA. That's correct. Poly A tail protect mRNA in the cytoplasm, that's correct. So what it means, what they say, like when this mRNA go into the cytoplasm, right? So this mRNA will not stay forever. Otherwise, whatever you make, like when you were, you know, a, a baby, you're still making the same protein right now, which is not true, right, for some of them. So we only produce protein as needed. So when it go into the cytoplasm, you know, there will be some enzyme that, you know, cut or trying to destroy this uh, mRNA. And, you know, the, the poly A tail will be, you know, cleave or cut by one by one until it reach the, the exon part. So then once the exon is destroyed, it, you cannot, you can no longer make the protein that you need, right? So it's done. So intron contain a uh, regulatory gene, so that's correct. So this one would be all of the above. Okay. okay. The following statement of translation are true except. So now again, except. Be careful. So ribosome consists of small and large subunits. So instead of this, let's see, I'm, I'm gonna go through this, um, the step of the uh, translation a little bit. 
So with this from here, we start from this mRNA, right? So now, for now mRNA, once we have mRNA from transcription, this mRNA move or transfer from nucleus into the cytoplasm, right? So, and in this uh, cytoplasm, mRNA can find the ribosome, right? And ribosome can be two places. So one is on the rough ER, another one would be in the cytoplasm, it's a free-floating uh, ribosome, right? So whatever protein that you make from the free-floating ribosome, it will be used within the cell, okay? So some of the protein that made from the um, ribosome bound to the rough RNA may be used in the cell or outside the cell, okay? So this mRNA will be bound with this, the small subunit of the ribosome first, right? And then also the large subunit. So this large subunit will have three sites, right? What are those three? Who are protecting those? Environmental Protection Agency, right? EPA. So we have EPA. So the first, very first tRNA will bind to which site? P, right? And then the next one will come and buy at A site, okay? So, and let's see if I can fix them. So I just put the blue one and it's the first one, let's say, if we have this, the first one will also have this, um, the tRNA, so we have, let's talk about tRNA. What is tRNA? What, is t, what, what does T stand for? Transfer. So just like the name imply, what does it transfer? It transfer amino acid that is attached to it, right? So this code that's on you, let's say it's on your mRNA, Let's say if we start with AUG, let's say for example, so whatever that is on your uh, tRNA is the anticodon. So your anticodon would look as UAC, for instance, right? So and this one would make the methionine, let's say, right? Methionine will be transferred to the next TNA, you know, in the A site, right? So we have this one. This one will come down, come to with another amino acid, right? So, as the name said, once we have the uh, TNA, tRNA at the A site, the amino acid on the tRNA at the P site will be, will transfer to the next one, right? So once it transfer, the one that had uh, amino acid removed will move to the E site, right? And then from A will move to the P and the same cycle repeat, you know? Whatever is in E site, next one is to leave the ribosome, okay? So that's how it works, and then once it get to the stop codon, then it stop producing, you know, um, the uh, stop attaching uh, the amino acid because stop codon doesn't produce any amino acid. Okay, so for this one then, um, the following statement of the translation are true, except, so ribosome contain the Small and large subunits, correct, right? So what else? Uh, large part contain EP and A site. mRNA dictate the amino acid group. That's correct. mRNA has anticodon. That's wrong, right? mRNA has codon. tRNA has anticodon. 
Where's the code? Where's the code? The code is in the DNA, right? So that's what the mRNA transcribe from. So, so the answer would be that one because that one is not correct. Okay. 48, which of the following is not true regarding translation? So T A T R N A matches it anti-codon with codon and release the amino acid. Is that correct? Right? All TNA bind at A, P, and then E site. Is that correct? Is that correct? Which one, wha where does the first one bind to? P, right? So that means the first one doesn't bind to A site. So this one is wrong, okay? So not all, most of them, okay? So next one, multiple ribosome can process on an, uh, on one RNA, mRNA at the same time. Is that possible? Yes, right? You can have multiple of them work on it. So the answer to this one is B. Okay. All right. Which of the following is not true? Well, I have a little separated here, so I'm going to put some here. Is it on the same here? So, two identical sister chromatids are attached at centromere. Is that correct? Right? So, we have, um, that's correct for the attached. The centromere are on metaphase plate during metaphase. Is that true? Yeah, right? Centromere can be separated in cell division. Can it be separ separated? Yes, right? Because one is separated, it becomes its own chromosome, right? So that's also true. Kinetochore core is a protein that sits on the side of centriole. Where does it sit on? We talked about it earlier. Centromere, right? Not centriole. Centriole is where it makes the spindle fiber, right? So this one is wrong. So the answer is this one because we talk about not true. Okay. So 50, missense mutation produced a premature stop codon. Is that correct? What makes a premature stop codon? Nonsense. What is missense mutation then? make the protein that's different from what it's supposed to, right? Um, silent mutation is when you make, when your DNA change, right? But you still make the same protein. Uh, I'm sorry, make the same amino acid. So this one is false. So 51. Which of the following is not true about TCA? So pyruvate are brought in mitochondrial matrix through Tim Tom, or Tom facilitated port. Is that correct? Almost correct. Everything else up to here is correct. It, what's wrong is this one. What's wrong with that? Tim and Tom are active transport. So that one is wrong. Okay. Citric acid was formed by a pyruvate and oxaloacetate. Everything is correct except this one. What, co what combined with the oxaloacetate to get citric acid? Acetyl-CoA, right? So that one has to be acetyl-CoA. So for each cycle, NADH, ATP, and FAD are 
obtained. So that one is correct. So the not correct is A and B. Right? Last one, I think, is a very simple here. Uh, uh, we just have to identify what is on here is mRNA. That determines series of amino acids for mRNA below. So we start with UCA, where is U? UCA is this one, right? So the first one, it has to be serine. So the first three are not, so it's out, right? So we can look, everything else the same. We can just look at the last one, right? So the last one would be UGU, where's UGU? UGU is right here, which is cysteine. So that one is the right answer. Right. Oh. Down or up? <laughs> or I can just zoom out a little bit. Okay. All right. So um, for the last, I guess, fib, maybe 13 minutes, you know, I can put this out here. So if you want to take a picture of what I already wrote, that's fine. And I would like you to help me out with the survey a little bit, so whatever is good or bad, you can put it on here, just for kind of help us out. And I'm more than happy to answer any question in the, in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, yeah. So if you don't mind, let's put it in. Thank you. And then when you're done, you can just leave it on the table. Yeah, thank you. Could you please pass that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I can, yeah. I'll, I'll, once I distribute all this, I'll come here. Right, thank you. Appreciate it. So once you're done, just leave it on the table. I can grab them. Thank you. So, which one is on RNA? Mm -hmm. But can, R can DNA have you? Right? Thank you, appreciate your help. So somebody was having questions. No, that one is so that one is so so wet so you said so wet. That's so wet, that's all you. That one is 20 saw you. Saw you and 80 for water. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's why the percentage okay. is easier. Also for safety, that one's a little bit different. No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. No and then for safety, that was false, correct? That is false. Mm -hmm. And then 49, I'm sorry, but that one I kind of confounded with uh, the 
Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate your help. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I guess I, I didn't talk about it, but so it's it's because of that what we call the um, non disjunction, uh, I guess. Yeah. So. Something to do with that. Yeah. So. So, how is it, how is so the thing is basically everybody, every female has two X chromosome, right? It just happened that you.